Hello participants, I bring you very warm greetings from Nigeria. My name is Emel Daudo and I'm a professor of linguistics and Nigerian languages. I work on indigenous languages from the University of Uyo, where I am currently employed. Living and working in an environment with several indigenous languages has given me a feel of the issues of indigenous languages. My primary focus has been on Nigerian languages, which provides a doorway to the rest of Africa with slight modifications, and I will be drawing profusely from the Nigerian context. It gives me great pleasure to speak on the subject that I'm extremely excited about, that is Nigerian languages. Addressing the rise of these languages is very appropriate currently. I am glad that we have converged here to discuss not just the rights of indigenous voices, but hands as well. I am incredibly pleased to join the conversation and I'll be looking at language rights and African indigenous spoken languages. Africa is home to about 2,144 languages, accounting for about 30% of the world's languages according to Ethnologue 2020. A few of these languages are foreign and imported from elsewhere, but majority of them are indigenous. There are therefore several categories of languages drawn from six main phyla, the Afro-Asiatic, Nalo-Sahara, Niger-Congo A, Niger-Congo B, Khoisan, and Austronesian. These languages can be classified into indigenous, national, official, lingua franca, pigeons, and creoles. Africa is a linguistically diverse continent. Before the advent of the colonialism, the pre-colonial groups and communities existed in the continent. The attempt to deal with the diversity that became a barrier to the colonialists led to policies that had some negative effects on the languages from the beginning. Colonial languages were installed in the different countries after the partitioning of Africa. Such languages were promoted not just as official languages but also public languages. With the installation of such languages, the African languages were dethroned, even in the affairs of the Africans themselves. Most of the linguistic problems experienced in Africa today were caused by colonialism. The enthronement of the colonial languages caused the marginalization of the indigenous languages. We argue that speakers of African indigenous languages are entitled to some rights. Such rights border on the choice of language to use for communication in the home, and community, education, business, media, etc. In this keynote, we explore the linguistic rights of speakers of indigenous African languages of both majority and minority groups. We approach this right from the perspective of equity and fairness within the overarching framework of human rights drawn from some international, regional, and national instruments like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the Cultural Charter for Africa, etc. Within this larger framework of human rights, there have arisen many movements on linguistic rights, like the language ecology, the linguistic human rights, and the minority language rights. Specifically, we address the linguistic rights from the perspective of the Minority Language Rights Movement of May 2003. We note that although provisions are made for the rights of the indigenous African languages in the different instruments, the huge numbers of the languages involved and the complexities of the socio-political and ecological realities erode these rights and render the efforts on implementation 
ineffective. Language is an extremely important aspect of a people. It is at the center of the universe for the simple reason that everything that humans have made and achieved has only been made possible using the human language. Language is primarily a medium of communication. It is an important index of identity and it serves as a repository of a people's culture, history, exploits, etc. It is a source of identity, an essential part of culture, as well as a vehicle for transmitting the culture of a people. Language expresses indigenous knowledge systems, values, and traditional practices. In fact, language is the most obvious marker of culture. It is used to participate in communal activities, and it fosters politics and democratic culture, as well as enrich the individual. Language is an archive of the people's wealth and the way of life. It is a collection of the accomplishments of a people, containing the ideas over time through heritage and indigenous traditions. The death of a language is therefore the loss of different aspects of humanity in the lives of a people, like biodiversity, heritage, etc. Language can divide and cause conflicts as much as it can unite. Therefore, the violation of language rights can cause serious conflicts indeed. Let us look more closely at the language categories that we mentioned earlier so that we can appreciate their intersection in the system and how they work. We will be looking at indigenous languages, official and national languages, lingua franca, pidgins, and creoles. Official languages are the languages used by a government for official purposes, as the name suggests. There are assigned legal standing, and most of the time there are the languages that the governments use. And there are all the ones mentioned in the constitutions of countries. The status of the official language can apply either to the whole nation or to a specific area. National languages are languages used within a nation. They may be shared by more than one group residing in a nation with which they communicate with each other in different domains. Sometimes they are used by the government officials in official business. They are also defined in the constitutions of the countries where they are spoken. These two terms have some overlap and they are sometimes used interchangeably. A common feature of both of them is that they are recognized by the governments where they operate, and they enjoy some official dom and legality. Many of the official languages in Africa are colonial languages, namely English, spoken in Nigeria, Ghana, Botswana, Kenya, etc. French, spoken in Cameroon, Mali, Niger, Senegal, etc. Spanish, spoken in North Morocco, Guterres, Guinea, etc. And Portuguese, spoken in Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique, etc. A few indigenous languages like Swahili, Beba, Hausa also serve as official languages. Lingua franca are languages used for communication between linguistically heterogeneous groups. Lingua franca may be either a trade language like a pidgin or a non pidginized language spoken widely in the territory. The Nigerian Cameroonian pidgins are spoken in Nigeria and Cameroon. Swahili is spoken across East Africa, while Hausa is spoken across West Africa. Pigeons are languages created in a deliberate attempt to communicate within heterogeneous groups that work or do business together. It is sometimes referred to as a trade language. While Creoles are first languages arising from officially created pigeons. 
Indigenous languages are languages spoken by indigenous people. Such languages are native to the groups. There are several indigenous languages in Africa and they constitute our primary focus here. Indigenous languages are native to regions or indigenous communities. National languages may be indigenous or exogenous. Official languages have legal backing to be used in countries or in specific areas. Most official languages in Africa are colonial languages. National and official languages, apart from the main advantage of providing a means of communication in multilingual countries, have some disadvantages. They breach the rights of the linguistic groups, especially the minorities and their privacy. And most children suffer from being taught in unfamiliar languages. Africa has a great diversity of ethno-linguistic groups, but most times those diverse ethnic languages are relegated to the background. A typical scenario in the countries is that of a colonial language is the official language. Even when one of the indigenous languages is chosen to be an official language, only a small population is involved. And so affairs of the countries in government, in administration, law, education, the media, etc., are conducted in exogenous languages. Before we articulate the linguistic rights of the languages, let us look very briefly at the linguistic situation in Nigeria as a case study for our discussion. The linguistic situation in Nigeria is rather chaotic due to the linguistic diversity. Nigeria is home to over 500 languages according to Ethnologue, accounting for 25% of languages spoken in Africa. Most of these languages have never been documented. 28 of these languages are listed in the UNESCO Atlas of Endangered Languages as endangered. In addition to these indigenous languages, there are three other foreign languages, English, French, and Arabic, which have become part of the Nigerian system over the years. English, as a language of official communication, has a prominent place in Nigeria. This is not surprising given its colonial history. French was made Nigeria's second official language in 1996, even though this has not been duly implemented. Arabic is connected to Islamic education and it is used extensively in the northern parts of the country. Nigeria also has recognized three indigenous languages, Hausa, Yoruba, and Igbo, as major languages which attract a lot of government patronage, as opposed to over 500 minor languages which do not attract much government attention. Although the country has no language policy, these linguistic guides are captured in the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Apart from this, there are some government agencies that have been established to promote and regulate language issues like the National Institute for Nigerian Languages. But then the funding to do the work is not adequate to yield the desired results. Regarding education in Nigeria, the National Policy on Education spells out the linguistic requirements in the sector. The medium of instruction in the primary school is the language of the environment, which is supposed to be used for the first three years of education at this level. English is supposed to be taught during this period as a subject. So, the child begins this level of school at age six with their mother tongue or the language of the environment. This is for those who do not attend pre-primary level. Although the medium of instruction in the pre-primary level is also supposed to be the mother tongue or the language of the environment, this is not always the case. As the schools at the level of are dominantly owned by the private sector. Many of them try to justify their international status and as such do not abide by this aspect of the policy. They rather use English throughout and discourage use of the indigenous languages. 
In fact, sometimes people are punished for speaking the vernacular. The curriculum for primary education includes the following language courses. Language of the immediate environment, English, French, and Arabic. The language of the immediate environment may not be the mother tongue of all the students in the class. In the pre-primary, the policy states that the government should develop orthographies of Nigerian languages and produce textbooks in these languages. In the secondary school, the language of the environment should be taught as L1, where it has an orthography. And one major language other than the language of the environment should be taught as L2. A major language should be taught as a core subject along with English and French, etc. Several problems hamper the implementation of this policy as stated. Firstly, most of these languages do not have orthographies. Neither are they developed to accommodate the needs of education, especially regarding science and technology, even at these levels. Secondly, Learning at least one major language is supposed to promote social interaction and national cohesion. Even this aim is defeated by the lack of teachers and teaching materials. Besides, none of the three major languages has a truly national status, as they are all spoken mostly in their different geopolitical zones. So, the average Nigerian is burdened with these languages at different stages of education. The speakers of the major languages clearly have an advantage over the speakers of the minority languages. And so regarding politics and administration, the government's support of the three major languages puts them at an advantage. The constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria empowers the three languages to be used along with English in the national assemblies. How? Do we articulate the language rights? Language rights refer to the fundamental rights protecting language-related acts and values, according to DeWitt et al. 2008. They have to do with the use of one's language, either in private or public, in business, in the media, in administration, in the judiciary, in education, etc. Language rights are important for accessing other aspects of human rights. Such rights contest and should check language oppression and domination, which enforce language loss. Some of the rights we should be addressing are Right number one, the right to exist. Every language primarily has the right to exist and be used in all domains of endeavor. Right number two, right to protection. Speakers of indigenous languages have the right to protection. Their languages have the right to be protected from being moribund and threatened to death. They have the right to intergenerational transfer and protection from language shifts, which cause language death. They have the right to protection from forced assimilation into dominant languages. Right number three, right to language equality and social justice. Every language has the right to equality and social justice. It is therefore unfair to classify languages with the labels like majority and minority languages, which permit discrimination. Right number four, right to promotion of identity. The speakers have the right to enjoy and develop their languages as well as develop positive actions to ensure a healthy linguistic diversity. Right number five, right to education. Speakers of indigenous languages have educational language rights. They have the right to learn in their mother tongue and right to be taught in the same. They have the right to choose which language to, or languages to learn. Right number six, right to revitalization. Revitalization secures right to education, especially in endangered languages. 
initiative to protect minority languages should therefore not focus only on education but also on revitalization. There is a major limitation on language rights in Africa. It borders on the dichotomy placed on the indigenous languages by the language policies of countries, which classify the languages into major, majority, and minor minority languages. Such dichotomies create advantages for those who speak the major majority languages and disadvantages for those who speak minor minority languages. For socio-political reasons, this sometimes creates language oppression and shift, which lead to the demise of the oppressed languages. In the context of use of these labels, majority languages enjoy many privileges. There are the official language and dominant languages, which makes them accepted. There are the legitimate and can be imposed on others. They are bound with the government and so preferred by the government as they are used in government services. Such languages are advantage to those whose mother tongue they are and they are used to access many privileges like education, employment, etc. The majority languages are languages of power and they are not threatened. On the other hand, Minority languages are discriminated against and highly threatened and oppressed languages. They can be easily assimilated by the majority language or lingua franca they are in contact with. Minority languages are marginalized in political, economic, and other sectors, and they carry a heavier burden. They benefit less from the government, and they have incredibly low status. We see this dichotomy in the classification of indigenous languages as a major limitation in the linguistic rights of the speakers of these languages. What is the way forward? The indigenous languages, especially the minority languages, are underdeveloped, underdescribed. These qualities infringe on even their fundamental rights to exist and be used in all domains, as we have seen. We cannot continue to say that the languages are too many for their issues to be addressed. We suggest that we do the following. Number one, documentation and description of all the languages. We need to document and describe the indigenous languages and thereby empower them for use and increased vitality. Given the Nigerian case, with the languages at different stages of development, there is a need for strategy to do this in a systematic way. Some languages may need to begin from the documentation stage, some from the orthography, while others may need to begin from the expansion and codification stage. The strategy should deal with not just corpus planning, but also status planning. We need tools, both software and hardware, for surveys, field work, documentation, archiving, etc. Many of such tools require interdisciplinary expertise. We could develop tools in our different institutions working as linguists. Two, review of language policies. There is need to review the language policies in African countries. The Nigerian scenario is a case in point. The dichotomy between majority and minority languages supports discrimination. While the major languages attract government attention, the patronage, the minority languages are left at the mercy of their speakers and pressure groups. They are also not protected. Three, advocacy and education. There is a lot of ignorance on, languages, on language issues. Majority of the people do not know the importance of their language and therefore cannot appreciate the need for urgency and rehabilitation. They do not see that they have any language rights. They do not know that they have any language rights. There is need therefore advocacy and education 
of the people, especially the minority language speakers, on the importance of their languages and the rights that they have. The government should promote the use of mother tongues as a medium of instruction to ensure that the right to education is not undermined by the student's lack of comprehension. Number four, a different approach to language endangerment. A different approach to language endangerment is needed. We should redefine the approach to it. There is need to develop a formula to preserve the indigenous languages while working out strategies for the survival of different aspects of life, build capacity for language sufficiency, and address language endangerment from novel perspectives. Without doubt, almost all aspects of science and other disciplines nowadays are increasing in demand for high quality information to realistically model the real world and make decisions from reliable information. We advocate for the use of Geographic Information System GIS framework to capture, store, manipulate, retrieve and interpret massive spatial geographic data. This technology has found usefulness in documenting the languages of the world. This kind of documentation provides a multidisciplinary solution for advancing our understanding of the spatial pattern that describes language ecology, as well as the degree of endangerment in relation to factors such as social and cultural changes of the languages. Apps can be developed from this and we know that this kind of technology has an allure for the younger generation and it could improve their interest in their languages, especially the was strengthened by lack of intergenerational transfer. Five, adequate funding and support for language development. We need adequate funding for the development of these languages. The number of languages should not deter us from working on them. We also need funding for research and to develop tools for the work on the languages. The government should support the efforts of minorities and indigenous peoples in the revitalization of their languages through consultation and funding allocations that reflect their objectives. Six, revision of language policies. Countries should develop robust language policies that can account for all the languages spoken in the country and provide a structure and support for the implementation of the plan in the policy. Their laws and policies should be revised in line with current understanding of language rights to ensure minority and indigenous language rights are respected. The government should involve minorities and indigenous peoples as well as language and human rights experts when developing language policies. Seven, legislation. The government should include language as a ground for discrimination in national legislation of the different countries. Restrictions on language use is a form of discrimination. Anti-discriminationary measures against minority languages and restrictions on their use should be backed up with legislation. Eight, address other rights violations. The government should recognize and address other rights violations, such as land evictions, displacements, and policies that may be contributing indirectly to language endangerment. Nine, access to essential services. The government should ensure access to services like health, administration, and justice, etc are in languages that the population understand, especially the minorities and indigenous peoples. 10. Research and collaboration. Experts, scholars, and institutions should continue to invest in research into the wide-ranging social and economic impacts of supporting linguistic diversity to provide data for advocacy and policy making. Human rights lawyers and language experts should work together to further develop a human rights based approach to language maintenance in collaboration with the groups concerned. 
In conclusion, African indigenous languages are important. The languages have rights, whether their populations are large or small. They have rights to exist, to be used in all domains, to be developed, to be protected from assimilation, shift, death, and discrimination. There are different categories of languages and they affect each other in the ecology. The linguistic rights of each category need to be properly articulated so that they are not infringed upon unwittingly. The majority languages are advanced are advantaged in terms of development, use, protection, and patronage from the government. The majority languages are accepted, legitimate, and official. They are bound to the government and are therefore preferred. They are used in government activities and services. They are indeed used to access privileges, education, and even employment. Indeed, they are advantaged to those whose mother tongues they are. On the other hand, the minority languages are disadvantaged. Their developments are left to chance and interested community sociocultural groups and they are not protected. Government policies need to be carefully designed, planned and implemented to account for these rights. The dichotomy between major and minority languages should be removed or handled better to remove discrimination and protect all the languages. Language rights intersect with many other rights and language is an important part in the realization of other rights in the areas of health, education, cultural life, politics, access to fair trial, etc. Physical displacements endanger languages. Therefore, land issues for indigenous people indirectly would protect language rights. It is important to create environments that protect human rights so that there will be no disruptions that can lead to language loss. For instance, internally displaced persons camps in northern Nigeria and the Darfur in Sudan are cases of concern here. We need to promote language rights, especially of the indigenous languages, now more than ever. Bearing in mind that language rights are particularly important for accessing other aspects of human rights. Thank you very much for your attention and God bless you.